Greetings from Golf Scorecards Incorporated, the largest scorecard printer in the United States. Although often overlooked, scorecards are one of the most important purchases a course can make. If you've ever had the misfortune of running out of cards in the middle of a busy season, you know what we mean. Every golfer on your course uses your scorecard, and it's in your best interest to make sure it's as functional and aesthetically pleasing as possible. We've created a video to help you do just that. We're going to be covering a lot of ground here, so if you see a topic you'd like to skip to, you can fast forward the video to the timestamp listed for that section. The first two sections cover the basics of scorecard design. We discuss the importance of keeping your card simple and consistent with your marketing material, as well as what the general look and feel of your card says about your facility. Sections 3 through 10 go over each element of the scorecard individually and cover everything from organizing your grid to choosing a font. The next two sections discuss the logistics of scorecards, what paper to use, how many to order, and how these factors affect price. The next section briefly covers some of the recent trends we've seen in the golf industry and how they will impact your scorecard design. Section 14 goes over some of the extra features that alter the appearance of the scorecard or add functionality. And finally, Section 15 takes all of the concepts we discuss in this video and applies them to real-world scorecard designs. Of course, if you have questions about a subject not included in this video or would like more information about a certain topic, feel free to email us at info at golfscorecards.com, call 800-238-7267, or check out our website at golfscorecards.com. Brand image. First off, your marketing department may already have branding guidelines in place that dictate the appearance of all your course's marketing material. These guidelines can be fairly comprehensive, covering everything from font selection to color schemes, so you'll want to refer to them when you start designing your card. Most golf courses don't have branding guidelines, however. If this is the case, the first thing you'll want to do when you get started with your design is consider how you want to present your course. Even if you've never had a formal discussion about your facility's brand, you probably have a good idea of what image you want to project. What words or phrases would you use to describe your facility? Is your course exclusive, conservative, and traditional? Relaxed, approachable, and family-friendly? Or maybe you're a luxurious destination resort promoting the vacation lifestyle. Once you've settled on a few key words or phrases that describe your course, take a look at your scorecard and decide if the design supports that image. Many private clubs want to project a traditional image and will use a small, simple card with a conservative design. This is especially true for clubs that want to highlight their exclusivity. On the other hand, some private clubs want to appear more approachable or family friendly. There is no right or wrong, it all depends on how the club wants to present itself. Resorts, especially facilities at destination resorts, will often want to wow people by using eye-catching photography that showcases their course and location. By focusing on what makes the course and surroundings special, you reinforce the good decision the golfer made in choosing to go to your resort. But again, there is no hard and fast rule. Some resorts, especially if the resort is a semi-private facility, may use a conservative private club style card. They do this when their goal is to reinforce their facility's exclusivity. Daily fee courses usually, but not always, want to appear friendly and approachable. There are a number of ways to do this. Most public courses use a combination of photos, maps, and colors to illustrate their openness and accessibility. If they have banquet facilities or wedding venues, they may take advantage of the card to advertise those services as well. However you describe your facility, remember to make sure your scorecard design supports the image you're trying to project. In this section, we learned how to tailor the design of the scorecard to match the kind of facility you operate. Private clubs often want to project a traditional image and will use a small simple card with a conservative design. 
Resorts will often put beautiful photography on the card to showcase their location, and public courses will often use a combination of colors, maps, and photos to appear friendly and approachable. Design Basics In addition to considering how you want to brand your golf course, there are two things to keep in mind when designing a scorecard – simplicity and consistency. Rule number one – keep it simple. There's a lot of information on the scorecard. Well-designed cards are always those where the information has been pared down to what is useful to the golfer while on the course. This includes a clean and easy-to-use scoring grid, rules that are pared down to what is needed while on the course, and other essential information. Remember that white space is your friend. You have to have some white space on your scorecard if it is going to be easy to use and attractive. Rule number two, think of your scorecard as an extension of your marketing material. Coordinate your design with other marketing materials. This includes both your printed materials and your website. Consider also that many golfers will take their scorecard home with them. The image they have of your course will be around as long as that scorecard remains in their possession. Making your scorecard grid easy to use. The scoring grid is the most important part of the scorecard. Well-designed grids are important for golfers. You need to make sure it is easy to use, well-organized, and as decluttered as possible. Here are a couple pointers to keep in mind when you're designing your grid. First off, the placement of your tees. There are two different ways of arranging your tees. You can split them up into men's and women's tees, like the card on the left, or put them all at the top of the grid, like the card on the right. If you have a lot of tees, splitting them up can be a good way of avoiding confusion over which tees are men's and which tees are women's. On the other hand, if your tees are gender neutral, you might want to stack them all at the top and use color coding to differentiate one tee from another. You'll have to experiment with your grid and see what looks best. Now, look for ways to reduce the total number of rows on the grid. This will allow your scoring lines to be larger and usually makes your grid more aesthetically appealing. For starters, we can combine par lines using a slash if there are any differences. Sometimes you can combine handicap lines as well, again using a slash if needed. If there are too many differences between the men's and women's handicaps, you might want to leave them as two separate lines. Plus, if you separate the T lines, it helps to identify the top tees as men's tees and the bottom tees as women's tees, especially if you include the genders on the handicap lines. If you are unsure which way would be better, ask your scorecard designer for their advice. If you've got combo tees, you can use an entirely separate row or use arrows, circles, or diamonds to indicate which tee to use. You'll probably end up with some extra space after consolidating these rows, which means you can widen your scoring area. You want the scoring part of the grid to be as big as possible. Golfers need enough space to write their names, record their scores, and put down any other info they need, like their member number. If your grid is still looking too crowded and you've got room on your rules panel, you can migrate the rating and slope info to a different part of the card. Keep in mind that if you have a lot of cart play, you'll want to move essential info like whole numbers to the middle of the grid. The steering wheel clips in the carts cover up the top half inch of info, so anything your golfers are going to need should be moved down. Finally, consider the use of color on your grid. This is a standard looking grid, with the background of the T rows colored in. If you're going for a more conservative look, you might want to color the yardage numbers instead of the background. See how much more subdued that makes it? Now let's compare. We've gone from three handicap lines to two, combined the par lines, and went from separate combo lines to circles. The extra space has gone to enlarging the scoring grid. Which grid would your golfers rather use? Before we bring this section to a close, let's have a brief discussion about vertical grids. 
Vertical grids are not very common, and the courses that do use them tend to be conservative private facilities. In the early days of golf, most scorecards were printed with vertical grids, the idea being that it was easier to do math when the numbers were stacked on top of each other. Although most courses have long since transitioned to horizontal grids, clubs that want to emphasize their respect for tradition might choose to use a vertical grid. Vertical grids are functionally the same as horizontal grids. There are no particular advantages or disadvantages to using a vertical grid over a horizontal one. Also remember to orient your grid properly. When you open the scorecard, make sure the top of the grid is on the left-hand side and the bottom of the grid is on the right-hand side. Finally, many cards with vertical grids use a horizontal or landscape orientation on the front cover. If you have a photo on your front cover, consider how it would look as a landscape layout. We covered a lot of material in this section. To recap, here are some of the main things we talked about. You can put all your tees on the top of the grid or split them up with men's on top and women's on bottom. Try both options and see which looks better. Reduce the total number of rows on the grid by combining handicap lines, combining par lines, or using arrows, circles, or diamonds to indicate combos instead of using a separate tee line. Make the scoring part of the grid as large as possible. In some cases, you might want to decrease the height of the tee lines in order to up the height of the scoring boxes. If your grid looks too crowded, consider moving the rating and slope info to a different part of the card, like the rules panel. If you've got a lot of cart play, move essential info like whole numbers to the middle of the grid. If you're going for a more conservative look, color the yardage numbers instead of the background of the T-rows. Some clubs use vertical grids. If you want one on your card, just make sure that when you open the scorecard, the top of the grid is on the left-hand side and the bottom of the grid is on the right-hand side. Should I use a photo, and is the photo I have any good? Think about what kind of image you want your scorecard to project. If you want a more traditional scorecard, you probably don't want a photo. Here are some examples of scorecards with conservative designs. Notice the logos are the only thing on the cover. There are no photos anywhere. Now, see what happens when we add the photos to the covers? They become a lot less conservative looking, don't they? One more time, notice the difference? If you do end up using a photo, you need to make sure it's crisp, at least 300 dots per inch when sized to fit your scorecard. If your photo is any less than 300 dpi, you run the risk of it printing out blurry. Which photo would you rather have on your card, the one on the left or the one on the right? If you're not sure what dpi your photo is, just send it to your scorecard printer and they will be able to tell you. When you send photos to your scorecard designer, always make sure to send them the original file. As you can see, my phone gives me four options when sending files, small, medium, large, and actual size. While your device might prompt you to send a smaller file at first, make sure you always send the largest file size possible. What if you don't have a good photo? Luckily, just about any smartphone can take a photo good enough to go on your scorecard. The first thing to consider is whether you want a landscape or a portrait layout on your scorecard. In general, portrait photos work well for 6x8 and 6x12 cards, while landscapes are good for 4.5x12 cards or a two-panel spread on a 6x12. That's the rule of thumb, but sometimes things aren't so straightforward. Say you've got a photo you really like, but it doesn't fit your scorecard design. Let's take this photo as an example. It's a landscape shot, but you've got a 6x8 card. Doesn't work so well, does it? But hey, what if you make it smaller so it only takes up part of the cover? There, that's better. If your photo is high enough resolution, you can expand it to fill the cover and crop out the bits you don't want. Finally, you can rotate the photo. There's a lot of nice clubs with really pretty landscape shots that have done this to make it fit. 
While these are all possible solutions, it's probably easier to just keep in mind whether you need a landscape or portrait photo when you go to take your pictures. Now you need to figure out what you're going to shoot. You need to ask yourself what makes your golf course unique. Every golf course has a signature hole or view. Think about what makes your course different from all the others and try to capture that feature in your photo. All the photos on these cards are of things you aren't going to see at any other course. It's what sets them apart. Once you've figured out what you're going to take a picture of, take a couple pictures early in the day or late in the evening. You want to take photos when the sun is low in the sky. It gives the photo greater shadow contrast and makes colors appear rich and saturated. See the long, dramatic shadows in these photos? That comes from the time of day the photo was taken. The same photo taken at midday would look very different. Now that you have your photos, take a couple minutes to really examine them. Focus on the details. Are there RVs in the background? Telephone poles? Construction equipment? Take another photo, or see if your scorecard designer can edit them out for you. We've covered a lot of ground in this section, everything from how to send your photo to what time of day to take the shot. Here's an example of a card with a photo that exemplifies everything we've talked about so far. The head pro at Jug Mountain needed a photo for the cover of his card. He knew it had to be a landscape shot, and that the picture had to be of something unique. One morning, he saw the mist rising from the water hazard and snapped a picture of it with his smartphone. It turned out great, didn't it? The lighting, the mist rising from the water, it all makes for a very impressive photo. More importantly, it's an example of a photo anybody can take. We see a lot of stunning photography taken from airplanes or through the lens of a several thousand dollar camera. These pictures are incredible, but the Jug Mountain photo shows that you don't need a professional photographer to get a great shot. All you need is a smartphone and a little patience. In this section, we went over everything you need to know about putting a photo on your scorecard. To recap, if you've got a conservative style card, you probably don't want a photo on the cover. If you do use a photo, make sure it's at least 300 dots per inch. If you don't have any good photos, you can take one with your smartphone. First off, think about whether the photo needs to be a landscape or portrait orientation. Then, try to take a picture of something unique to your course. Take the picture at an angle that avoids any unpleasant details like RVs or telephone poles. Photos taken early in the morning or late in the afternoon usually look better than those shot at midday. Logo Requirements for many clubs, getting the logo exactly right is essential. It can't be even the slightest bit fuzzy or blurry. The same 300 DPI rule for photos also applies to logos. Your logo needs to be at least 300 dots per inch for it to print clearly. Your scorecard designer will be able to tell you if your logo file is print quality. If it's not, they can usually recreate it for you. Here you can see our designer tracing the outline of the Maidstone logo and retyping the date and name. The result is a crisp 300 dpi vector image suitable for print. Do you need a course map? Maps are particularly helpful at facilities where the majority of your golfers aren't familiar with your course and how to navigate from one hole to the next is not well marked or obvious. Most private courses won't want a map. Their members already know how to get around the course. On the other hand, public courses might want to consider putting one on their card. If you do end up using a map, the bigger the better. 27 or 36 hole facilities will definitely want a larger map, preferably covering two panels on a 6x12 trifold card. Maps have a lot of little details like tee boxes, greens, and cart paths that you can't see very well unless the map is a decent size. Maps are a good way to show the location of important things like restrooms, AED devices, drinking fountains, halfway houses, and lightning shelters all of which are difficult to see if your map is too small. 
If you want a more detailed layout of the individual holes, you might want to use hole-by-hole -hole graphics instead of an overall map. Hole-by-hole -hole maps are also a good way to display pro tips on the card. Overall maps are important to have if it's confusing to navigate from one hole to the next. But hole-by-hole -hole graphics are usually a better way to illustrate the location of hazards and help the golfer plan their shot. Keep in mind that if your carts have GPS units, your golfer is more likely to use the GPS map and won't need a map on the scorecard. Another feature you will find on cards is pin placement graphics. These show an overhead view of the green and label sections of the green with letters or numbers to indicate where the pin is located that day. Many courses follow a pattern of front, middle, back, front, middle, back, so after the first hole, the golfer knows where the pin is for the rest. However, if your course does not follow this pattern, or has more than three general areas, it becomes especially helpful to include pin placement graphics on your card. Pin graphics also allow you to show other useful information like the shape of the green, the location of bunkers and water hazards near the green, and the depth and width of the green. Some courses also use arrows to show slope directions. Here are some examples. This one only has three pin locations, but the pattern is not consistent. If the location that day is two, then it's middle, front, front, back, middle, front, and middle, back, front. That can be confusing if you're not familiar with the pattern. The green depths have also been included, which will help the golfer in selecting their club. A front placement versus a back placement is at least a one club difference. This next one has six different locations indicated with letters. Each front, middle, and back section has a left side and a right side. This card doesn't include any hazards, but this next one from Ruffled Feathers does. This course has a simpler pattern, but you can see that the location of bunkers and water hazards around the greens are very important. Also note how helpful it is to know the depth of the green, especially on hole number four, which runs from 27 yards to 76 yards. These graphics, as you have seen, can go above the grid or on a side panel. Above the grid requires a 6 inch high card or the elimination of scoring rows on a shorter card, but most of the time they are put on the third panel of a 6 by 12 card with 9 greens on a side. 18 greens also fit nicely on one side of a panel too. If you run out of space on your scorecard though, one solution is to make a card just for your pins. Charter Oaks has a nice pin card which fits into a holder on their golf carts. It shows both depth and width of the greens as well as having reminders of pace of play. This second pin sheet here is a good example too because it's got eight locations to keep track of. In this section we talked about maps on the scorecard. To recap, if you're a private course with members who know their way around, you probably don't need a map. If you're a public course without a lot of regular golfers, you'll probably want a map. Overall maps are good if it's confusing to get from one hole to the next, while hole-by-hole -hole graphics are better at showing the location of hazards and helping the golfer plan their shot. Regardless of the kind of map you use, make it as big as possible. Pin placement graphics are helpful if you've got a confusing pin rotation pattern or want to give your golfers additional information about the greens, like depth, width, and shape. If you don't have enough space on your scorecard for pin graphics, consider using a separate pin sheet. Cleaning up your back panel and rules. Now we are going to talk about the back panel. It is frequently overworked and can make a 4x6 or 6x8 space very crowded when you've got maps, ratings, rules, emergency numbers, staff names, and legal paragraphs on it. We've already talked about maps and we will go over contact information separately. For now we will focus on rules and other information which affects play and behavior on the course. Here are two cards with very different appearances. They both have important information, but the one on the left is so dense and the font is so small that the golfer won't even try reading it and will miss important information, that stones and bunkers are movable obstructions, for example. The panel information needs to be shorter and visually appealing or it will be ignored. 
In comparison, the easiest to read are panels with no rules, or just a simple statement saying USGA rules govern all play. These cards tend to belong to exclusive private courses where members already know the local rules and etiquette. I like the Country Club of Mobiles card, which uses the panel for notes about your round. Most courses do want some sort of guidelines on the card, though, to direct players or tell them about course-specific local rules. The USGA Rules of Golf book is 150 plus pages. Unless there are things unique to your course, you shouldn't have to repeat the USGA rules. Local rules that golfers need to know about are important to have on the card. Examples of local rules would be drop zone locations, environmental areas, or free relief from abnormal ground conditions, in this case, animal tracks. Safety and convenience information, such as lightning warnings, restroom locations, and irrigation with effluent water are also good to have on the card, as well as legal statements for liability. Some local rules can be edited down with a referral to the rules book. One that we see a lot of is sprinkler heads near the green. One card takes 84 words to describe this, while another does it in 40. Again, space is limited, so be judicious on choosing what to include. Think about what could be listed elsewhere. The ESC table, for example, could be posted in the Pro Shop. Clothing requirements could be listed on your website. The 90 degree rule could be posted in the golf cart and that all-important pace of play time can be watermarked on the scoring grid where it will be easily seen. There, now the panel is much more readable. All of this becomes even more important when you have a map that takes up over 50% of the back panel space. This occurs very frequently and really requires a judicious approach to what to place on the back panel. Which card do you think your golfers are more likely to read? Remember that less is more. You want this panel to be attractive and easy to read. In this section, we discuss the rules panel. To recap, don't repeat the USGA rules. These rules apply on all courses. Local rules are good to have on the card. Examples include drop zone locations, environmental areas, and free relief from animal tracks. Any local rules you include on the card should be as short as possible. Think about what rules could be removed from the card and posted elsewhere. The dress code, for example, could be posted in the Pro Shop. Address and contact information. Keep the address and contact info on your card pared down as much as possible. Here is an example of an address section with too much going on. Let's go through this one item at a time and decide if it really needs to be on the card. First up, the name of the club. Do we really need this? It's a bit redundant if you've got the name on the cover and the back of the card. If that was the only place on your scorecard that had the name of your club, then maybe you'd keep it, but we probably don't need it. Next, the phone numbers. These are good to have in case a golfer has a medical emergency or their cart breaks down, so we'll leave them. Now, the fax number. Be honest, how many of your golfers are going to send you a fax? best to just get rid of it. Next, the restaurant number. If you've got a restaurant or bar, it can be convenient to have this number on your card, especially if you let golfers order at the turn, so we'll leave that. What about the physical address? Do we need to keep that? Traditionally, golf clubs print the city and state on the scorecard. Whether you need the rest of the address info is a matter of personal preference. In this specific example, We'll get rid of the street address to make more room on the back panel, and move the city and state to the front cover. Finally, the website address. These days, you probably want to have your website listed on your scorecard, especially if people can make tea time reservations online, so we'll keep that. Now let's compare. The one on the right is much cleaner, isn't it? The main thing to remember with address info is to just limit it to the essentials. It keeps your card looking neat and organized. Here are a couple examples of alternate places to put your contact info. If you've got a 6x12 trifold card, it's pretty common to put it above the grid. A lot of clubs also put this information on the cover, too. Play around with it and see which location looks best. In this section, we went over how to clean up the contact information section of your scorecard. To summarize, here are some of the things that can probably go. 
Get rid of the name of the club, unless that's the only place you have it on the card. Get rid of the fax number. Get rid of the street address. Whether or not you keep the city and state is a matter of preference. Communicating color information to your designer. Getting your logo and club colors exactly right on your scorecard is important to a lot of people, and you will hear about it if they're off. There are a million different shades of red, green, and blue. When you say your card is red, what exactly does that mean? Here are three cards, all of which are red. Each shade of red is made by combining certain percentages of the individual ink colors that make up the CMYK color model, cyan, magenta, yellow, and black. You can see the breakdowns on the left. The one on top is 0% cyan, 100% magenta, 99% yellow, and 0% black. By altering the percentages slightly, you can get different shades. We upped the cyan and black for the middle card, which makes a darker, richer red. For the bottom card, we took down the magenta and yellow, but upped the black, which makes the red more of a dull, rusty color. The point of all this is to show the amount of variation you can get with colors. If your club uses specific colors, you can't just eyeball it and hope for the best. If there's a specific shade you want, you need to get that information to your scorecard designer. Luckily, there are a couple ways to do this, all of which are relatively easy. First, if you know the PMS, RGB, or CMYK colors your marketing department uses, your designer can use that info to recreate the exact color on your scorecard. These are three different systems for communicating color information and are roughly equivalent. For example, the color in the Riverside Golf Course logo in the bottom left corner is classified as PMS number 7510, which is equal to red 203, green 138, and blue 42 which is itself the equivalent of 19% cyan, 48% magenta, 100% yellow, and 2% black. All three of these systems are referring to the same shade of yellow. If you don't know the exact colors, but you have a digital file with the colors you want to use, like a JPEG of your logo, your designer should be able to extract the color from it. Finally, you can mail a physical sample to your designer, who will use a Pantone swatch book, like the one pictured here, to find your exact color. Using one of these methods, you can get your colors to your designer and avoid any potential grief from your members. In this section, we talked about how to communicate color information to your designer. To recap, there are three ways to do this. You can send them specific PMS, RGB, or CMYK colors. You can send them a digital file with the color you want to use. You can mail a physical sample to your designer. What you need to know about fonts. First off, fonts are easy. The main thing is to make sure your font size is large enough. Ten and a half points or above is good. Also remember to have a high contrast between the font color and the background color. Nobody can read a dark blue font on a black background. You want to either use a dark font with a light colored background or a light font on a dark colored background. Generally, a dark font on a light background is easier to read though. Now you need to decide what font to use. There are a dizzying number of font styles out there. Luckily, all of them can be broken down into four different families. Serif fonts, sans serif fonts, decorative fonts, and script fonts. We almost never use decorative or script fonts because they can be difficult to read. The real choice you'll have to make is between serif and sans serif fonts. Serif fonts are fonts with little decorative flourishes at the top and bottom of each letter. Here are two of our favorite serif fonts, Gaudi and Garamond. Sans serif fonts are simply fonts without those little flourishes. Two sans serif fonts we use a lot are Gil Sans and Avant Garde. When you're choosing a font, readability is the top priority. These two grids are the same except for the font. As you can see, the one on the left is much more readable than the one on the right. People go back and forth on whether serif or sans serif fonts are more readable. In the end, 
we recommend just going with whatever font the rest of your marketing materials are written in, or one that is similar. Whatever font you end up using, remember to keep it legible. That means at least 10.5 points in size with a high contrast between the font color and the background color. In this section, we went over what fonts to use on your scorecard. Here are three things to keep in mind as we wrap up this section. First, make sure your font size is large enough. Anything smaller than 10.5 points is going to be difficult to read. Next, make sure there's a good contrast between the font color and the background color. Finally, keep the font consistent with the rest of your marketing material. what you should look for in a paper. Before we get too far here, keep in mind that a lot of concepts we're going to be discussing are difficult to communicate through a video. When you choose a paper, insist on getting physical samples from your scorecard printer. You need to know what the paper feels like, and the only way to do that is to hold it in your hand. The paper your scorecard is printed on is very important. While there are many different types of paper, you want to make sure that whatever your card is printed on is both writable and stiff. Writability is essential for obvious reasons. A non-flexible paper is also important though, because the majority of your golfers will be holding the card in the palm of their hand while they're using it. While there are many different kinds of paper, they generally fall into two families, coated paper and matte paper. Coated paper refers to any paper stock that has been coated by some sort of compound or polymer and ranges from a slight sheen to a high gloss. The intensity of the sheen depends on what kind of coating it is and how much is applied. Coated papers are nice because they really make photos and colors pop, but some coated papers are not very writable. If you print on a coated stock, make sure your golfers can write on the paper. Matte paper refers to dull, uncoated paper and can be further divided by whether or not the paper is smooth or textured. Textured stock can then be broken down by type of texture. Two common textured stocks are felt and linen. Matte paper is often preferred among traditional, high-end, private facilities because it feels like an expensive paper. The lack of coating also means it takes a pencil very well. Be warned, though, that if you use a matte stock, your photos and colors might not come out quite as brightly compared to a coated stock. Because matte paper is uncoated, the ink from the printing press sinks into the fiber, causing edges to be slightly less defined and colors to be a bit muted. Here you can see the comparison. The first card is printed on coated stock. You can see the colors are very bright and the edges are crisp. The next card is printed on a matte stock, which lends a different feel to the photo. That's not to say you can't use a photo. Many clubs like the distinctive look you get from printing on matte stock. There is also a third type of paper that is coated on one side. A combination of coated and matte paper, this stock is good for clubs that want to have a pretty picture on one side with brilliant colors, but excellent writability on the grid side. Here at Golf Scorecards, our house stock is a coated paper with a very slight sheen. We use it because we think it's the best of both worlds. The coating keeps the colors vibrant while not being overly shiny. It also has excellent writability and stiffness. Whatever paper you go with, keep in mind that using any kind of non-standard or specialty paper over whatever your scorecard printer uses as their standard paper will likely be more expensive. In this section, we discussed paper stock and what variables to keep in mind when selecting the stock you print on. To recap, when choosing a paper, make sure it is both writable and stiff. There are two kinds of paper, coated and uncoated. Coated paper makes photos and colors really pop, but may not be very writable. Uncoated paper, also called matte paper, is very writable, but colors may be muted. A third kind of paper is only coated on one side. This can be a good alternative if you want vibrant colors on one side, but good writability on the grid side. Your printer will likely have a house stock that most of their cards print on. If you choose a paper different than their house stock, it will likely cost more. Regardless of the paper you end up printing on, make sure you get physical samples first. You need to know what the paper feels like, and the only way to do that is to hold it in your hand. Scorecard Economics and Quantity Most scorecard printers charge similar prices. 
What you pay will vary widely, however, based on paper stock, card size, and quantity ordered. The paper stock you print on will heavily influence price. If you're on a tight budget, you'll probably want to stick with whatever paper your scorecard printer offers as their house stock, assuming, of course, that the paper is writable and stiff. Card size is the next big influencer of price. Scorecards come in multiple sizes, but generally speaking, they are either large or small. Small cards are typically 6x8 or 4 and a half by 12 Large cards are commonly 6x12 or 5x12. Ultra-large cards can be up to 6x18. The third and largest factor that affects price is the quantity ordered. 5,000 cards cost less than 20,000, which costs less than 40,000. But the cost per card on the 5,000 order is much more than on the 20,000 order, while the 40,000 order is more cost-effective than both of them. Here's why. In this example, the amount of paper and ink used for each card is the same three quarters of a cent. The more you print, the more the total cost of paper and ink will be. But the cost per card remains the same. Next to consider are fixed costs. Getting the press ready for printing, making the color plates, cleaning up after printing, etc. All of these things must be done, and it takes the same amount of time no matter what the quantity is. In this illustration, we show the fixed cost totaling $500. When you add the paper, ink, and fixed costs together, you can see that the cost per card changes dramatically. The total cost of 5,000 cards is $537.50, or 10 and 3 quarter cents per card. Compare that to 20,000 cards for $650 at 3 and a quarter cents per card, and 40,000 cards for $800 at two cents per card. These are just made up numbers, but you can see that even though you're spending more on paper and ink on the larger order, you're actually saving money because that fixed printing cost is the same. However, because you get a better price per card by ordering more, many people are tempted to order two or even three years worth of scorecards at once. Don't. It's Murphy's Law of ordering cards. As soon as that three-year supply shows up, you'll learn you're going to be re-rated next spring and still have 40,000 cards left, or a freak rainstorm floods hole 14 and you have to turn it from a par 5 into a par 3. We always recommend ordering just one year's supply of scorecards. It's usually a big enough amount that you still get price breaks while not being the end of the world if you have to make changes earlier than you originally thought. Of course, if you know you'll have changes coming, but are running low, you'll want to order just enough to get you by until those changes come in, at which time you can place your large annual order. So how many cards is a year's supply of cards? A good rule of thumb is to take two-thirds of the total number of rounds at your facility in a year. For example, if your course does 30,000 rounds per year, you'll probably want to order about 20,000 scorecards. Or, if you do 50,000 rounds, you'll need 33,000 cards. Most printers have standard quantities for printing, so in this case it may require ordering 40,000 cards every 15 months. Bear in mind that this is just an estimate. Actual card usage on your course will vary from year to year based on a variety of factors including weather, number of rounds played that year, and visitors taking the card as a souvenir. But a look at your historical rounds and the size of your scorecard orders should confirm the annual number of cards used. It also pays to watch your scorecard inventory carefully, and always place your next order before opening your last box. You need to allow enough time for changes, printing, and delivery. Check with your printer to see how much time is needed to turn around an order. It is no fun to run out of cards, and expensive, too. We covered a lot of material in this section. Here's a recap. The price you pay for scorecards will vary widely based on quantity, paper stock, and size of the card. Paper stock is the first variable that affects price. We talked about paper in a previous section, so we won't discuss that in length here. Scorecard size is the next factor. The larger the card, the more expensive it will be. Scorecards come in three general sizes. 
Small cards are usually 6x8 or 4.5x12. Large cards are typically 6x12 or 5x12. Ultra large cards can be up to 6x18. Quantity is the final and largest variable that affects price. The more you order, the greater the total cost will be. Ordering a larger quantity gets you a better price per card, however, because of how the printing process works. Don't order too many cards, though. You don't want to get new ratings and still have two years' worth of cards left. We recommend ordering one year's supply of scorecards at a time. It's usually enough to benefit from the price breaks while not being the end of the world if you have to make changes earlier than you originally thought. A year's supply of cards is typically about two-thirds the number of your annual rounds. For example, if you do 30,000 rounds per year, you'll need about 20,000 cards. Remember, keep track of your inventory and always place your next order before opening your last box. Scorecard Design Trends The golf industry has embraced a number of changes over the last several years in an attempt to encourage casual and beginning golfers to either take up the game or play more. As a result, the scorecard has evolved as well, changing to accommodate the addition of tee it forward programs, junior tees, combination tees, pace of play reminders, and more. Here are some of the bigger trends we see and their impact on the scorecard. Tee it forward is a very common program we see, where more tee options are offered and golfers are encouraged to play at the tees that best match their ability. Tees are more likely to be gender neutral, making it comfortable for men who aren't long hitters to play from the shorter tees. Gender neutral means tees are no longer explicitly identified as men's tees or women's tees, and the colors are typically changed as well. If you have a tee at forward program, keep in mind how gender neutral tees will affect the layout of your grid. Here you can see all the tees have been put at the top of the grid, and the longest tees have been colored red, a color traditionally associated with shorter women's tees. Junior tees and family tees are something we see a lot as well. These tees are a common strategy to introduce kids to golf and are an important part of the player development program for many courses. If you have junior or family tees, remember you need enough space on the grid to accommodate them. If your grid is tight already, you might need to increase the size of your card or migrate some information elsewhere. Many clubs also put the information on a separate family tee card as well. Combination tees are a popular and low-cost way to make the course more interesting for golfers who play your facility regularly. Combo tees are great, but again, keep in mind how much space you have on the grid. We've already discussed combo tees earlier in this video. If you're running low on space on your grid, refer to some of our tips on how to display combo tees. Pace of play initiatives are becoming increasingly common, and the scorecard will often include a reminder to keep pace. Some cards include the pace of play in their rules somewhere, while other cards put the actual pace of play times on the grid. Liability statements are another fairly standard practice these days typically a line or two of text absolving the golf course of any liability for personal injury or property damage. Liability statements often go on the rules panel. If you are planning to include one on your card, you might have to edit down your rules to make everything fit. Scorecard dimensions tend to be getting taller as well, going from 4.5 or 5 inches tall to 6 inches tall. Whereas 10 years ago, 4.5 by 12 cards were most common, most cards these days are 6 inches tall to accommodate additional tee rows. 5 tee lines, 2 handicap lines, a par line, and 8 player spaces are much easier to arrange on a 6 inch tall card than a 4.5 inch tall card. In this section, we went over some of the trends that have influenced the design of the scorecard over the years. To recap, tee it forward a program that encourages people to play tees based on ability, not gender. If you've got a tee it forward program, you might want to put all your tees at the top of the grid 
and not color code them based on gender. Junior tees, a common tactic to get more kids out on the course. Junior tees take up space on the grid, so you'll need to keep that in mind when you're laying out your card. Combo tees, which can be a great way to make the course more interesting for your regular golfers. There are many ways to display combo tees, including arrows, circles, and diamonds. Pace of play is a very useful program to keep golfers moving at a reasonable speed. Watermarking the pace of play on the grid or including a time par per hole are both good options here. Liability statements are increasingly common these days. These statements can take up a lot of space on your rules panel, so keep them in mind when you're designing that part of the card. Card sizes are changing as well, going from 4.5 inches tall to 5 or 6 inches tall. This gives you more space for T rows on the grid, which can be helpful to have. Additional design features there are a number of special design features that alter the appearance of the scorecard or add functionality. The five we will be talking about are rounded corners, pencil slits, foil stamps, die cut windows, and second scores. Keep in mind that there may be an additional cost associated with these elements. If you're on a tight budget, you might want to avoid the features we discuss in this section, and most scorecards don't have any of these extra features anyway. Let's start with round corners. Round corners are the most common additional design feature we see, and that's perhaps one out of every four cards. It's good to know about them, though, in case you want to incorporate them into your design. Round corners are popular with clubs that have a lot of walkers because they make the card less likely to get snagged in pockets like square corners can. Round corners also have a distinctive look that many courses want to include in their design. Because round corners are a feature predominantly used by walkers, most cards with round corners are 6x8s, because larger cards are typically found on courses with a lot of cart play. Round corners require slight changes to the grid and any borders you have on your card, but other than that, the rest of the design remains the same. After printing, the cards are run through a special machine that cuts the corners. Many printers charge a nominal fee for rounding corners to recoup the time doing extra trimming at the end. Pencil slits are the next most common feature we see after round corners. Like round corners, pencil slits are usually requested by facilities that have a lot of walking play because they are a very effective way to hold a pencil. Pencil slits can either be perforated or die cut. We prefer die-cut pencil slits because the blade makes a clean cut all the way through, whereas perforations can tear if you're not careful. While we don't charge extra for pencil slits on standard orders, some scorecard printers do. We like to make pencil slits about an inch long, an inch apart, and about an inch away from any edges. This holds the pencil snug against the card and avoids any undue tearing. An important thing to remember with pencil slits is that if you print on a paper with special texture, the die may not cut all the way through because the paper is softer. Felt stock is one example of this. Double check with your scorecard printer whether or not that will be a problem with your stock, and make sure they have a plan if things get held up. Foil stamps are a feature we see occasionally, where clubs take part of their scorecard, usually the logo, and replace it with a foil stamp. Foil stamps come in many different colors and are made of actual metallic foil. First, a die or mold is created that matches the shape of the logo being replaced. Then, cards are run through a machine one at a time that uses heat and pressure to stamp the foil onto the card. The process can be time-consuming and labor-intensive, which coupled with the cost of materials usually makes foil expensive. But foil can really make your card stand out with its unique metallic look. Die cut windows are another feature we see, where a window is cut in the card so that you can fold the card over to see your totals from the front nine when you're figuring out the score at the end of the round. Die cut windows are typically seen on off-center fold cards, either 4.5 by 12 or 6 by 12, with the front nine on one side and the back nine on the other. 
Altering the design to accommodate a die cut window is fairly straightforward. You just need to make sure there's the same number of rows on the front nine as the back nine, and that you've included an out column on your back nine. Also be aware that this window takes up room on your rules panel. Die cut windows are another feature that requires additional processing after the cards have been printed, which usually makes them a more expensive addition to the card. Second scores are the final extra design element we will discuss in this section. Second scores are most commonly seen on 4.5 by 12 or 6 by 12 centerfold cards, with the second score usually between the fifth and sixth holes. This extra score line allows the player to fold the card over on itself so they can see their names, handicaps, and other information they need while they're playing the back nine. Some cards have multiple extra score lines. This card from the Olympic Club, for example, has a total of four score lines, two on the front nine, one in the center, and one on the back nine. Although we don't charge extra for additional scoring lines, some scorecard printers might. In this section, we went over some additional elements of the scorecard design that are not very common, but introduce additional functionality or a particular aesthetic to the card. Round corners are the most common extra design element we see. They require slight modifications to the design and some extra processing time. Pencil slits are another design element, and your walkers will appreciate them. Pencil slits can be perforated or die cut. We recommend die cut pencil slits because the perforated ones can rip. Foil stamps are a very rare design feature we sometimes see, where a course will take part of their card, usually the logo, and replace it with a foil stamp. This is time-consuming and expensive, but your card will really stand out. Die-cut windows are used on off-center 45 by 12 cards so that when you fold the card over, you can see your scores from the front nine when you're adding up your totals. They require some minor design modifications as well, so you'll want to know ahead of time if you want to use this feature on your card. Second scores are the final additional design feature we see. Usually found between the fifth and sixth holes, they allow the player to see names, handicaps, and other info when they're playing the back nine. Case studies. It's all well and good to know when to use a map on your card or how to display combo tees on your grid, but how do you actually put this information to use? We'll walk you through a few case studies that take an existing card and apply some of the design changes we talked about in this video. Some of these are total overhauls, changing everything from the size of the card to the colors used. Others stay essentially the same, but are updated to be more user-friendly or more in line with the club's aesthetic. As you will see, it is not always obvious that there is a better way to arrange the card, especially if it's a design the club has been using for years. All of them, however, are real-world examples of the principles we talk about in this video. Spring Creek Golf and Country Club is a very nice private club in Central California. For many years, they used this card. Let's take a look here. The card is 4.5 by 12 with a center score. The cover has a marketing blurb, not something you would expect on the scorecard for a private golf facility. The back panel has a map, also unusual for a member-owned private facility. Their rules text is a reasonable length, but overall this panel looks a bit crowded. To contrast, the grid is clean and well-ordered. In 2013, they wanted to change the cover to incorporate a photo of the clubhouse, which had been recently renovated and expanded. The text font was made a light tan to contrast against the dark background. Note that the color works well with the leaf color on the logo. The borders on the card were eliminated to create more space, and the rules panel has been opened up a bit. On the grid side, they added two combination tees, combo and super, as separate lines using the tee colors to indicate which tee to use. These added tees required getting rid of a scoring row, going from eight lines to seven. Overall, the color scheme looks more modern to fit the new clubhouse. In 2015, we were asked to totally redesign the card to be more consistent with what one would expect from a private club. Size-wise, the card went from 4.5 by 12 to 6 by 8, the size most commonly used by private golf facilities because it is a walker-style card 
that a golfer can put in their back pocket. A 6x8 also gives you the height to accommodate more tees without sacrificing scoring lines. The new logo, provided by the club, is more simplified and elegant than their old logo. Color-wise, we went with a conservative, muted color scheme, something that also reinforces a private club feel. In this case, we used just the brown from their logo against the tan background. Very handsome. Moving on to the back panel, the rules haven't changed at all since the first card. The ratings and slopes have been moved to this panel from the grid side, though. Note the map has also been removed. The truth is, club members don't need a map. You'll also see that the club name is not repeated on the back panel since room is at a premium. On the grid, we have now added a third combo tee, women's combo. And to keep the scoring lines at 7, we have combined the two par lines into one. We moved all the tees to the top and the handicap lines to the bottom, and we are now indicating the appropriate tees for the combo tees with arrows. Finally, we added round corners as well. To recap, over three iterations, Spring Creek has gone from 4.5 by 12 to 6 by 8, removed the map, added three combo tees, and changed the overall look of the card to be more consistent with that of a private, exclusive facility. Southern Hills Country Club, located in Tulsa, Oklahoma, is a venerable golf course, ranked 30th on Golf Digest's list of America's best golf courses. The 27-hole facility was established in 1936 and has hosted an impressive number of important championships. This is the scorecard they were using when they first contacted us to redesign their card. Looking at it, you would have no idea that Southern Hills is a prestigious golf club. The old card used a lot of bright colors and has a large photograph. Nothing about the design says private, or exclusive, or special. The golf pro and members wanted a new design that would reflect an image of tradition and exclusivity, all in an understated way. They also wanted to feature a list of the championships that have taken place at Southern Hills. On the new card, the size remained the same, but just about everything else changed. The original card was an off-center score design, which we changed to a trifold so that we could put each of the nines on its own panel, leaving one panel for ratings and another dedicated to the impressive list of tournaments Southern Hills has hosted. They also wanted just a logo cover, in keeping with the club's pedigree, and color-wise, just blue on tan. The result is simple and elegant. It is also one of the few times we put round corners on a 12-inch long card. We put round corners on the card because many of Southern Hills golfers are walkers, and round corners help keep the card from catching in pockets. Shadow Valley is a public facility located in Idaho. Their old card wasn't bad. The grid was very readable, not too many rules. But the card was also busy looking. The prominent rating and slope chart competes with the grid, and the colors are very bright, almost overwhelming. For the new card, the head pro wanted to add an overall map because a large portion of the players are not regulars. A map would help them get around easier and faster. On the back panel, you can see the new map, which is large and oriented vertically. The rules were modified somewhat, but note the abbreviated pace of play comment, and for emphasis, it is put in bold font. The new cover simplifies the design without the multiple colored borders and just the logo in the upper left corner. We recreated the logo to make it look high resolution. They sent a nice horizontal photograph, and rather than crop it to fit, we placed the photo horizontally and were able to utilize the complete picture. On the grid side, we softened the color scheme and added two combo tees. We also added an additional scoring line since the large area above the grid with the logo and ratings was eliminated. Interestingly, while the tees blue, white, yellow, and red, have their colors reflected in the yardage numbers, the combo tees use background coloring to easily identify which tee to use. To review, we added a map, modified the rules, bolded the pace of play comment, simplified the color scheme, enlarged the photo on the cover and set it horizontally, and added two combination tees. The result is a streamlined, simplified design 
that is easy to use and capitalizes on the course's stunning photography. We've covered a lot of material in this video. To recap, in the first two sections we covered the basics of scorecard design. We discussed the importance of keeping your card simple and consistent with your marketing material, as well as what the general look and feel of your card says about your facility. Sections 3 through 10 went over each element of the scorecard individually and covered everything from organizing your grid to choosing a font. The next two sections discussed the logistics of scorecards what paper to use, how many to order, and how these factors plus a dozen others affect price. Section 13 briefly covered some of the recent trends we've seen in the golf industry and how they impact your scorecard design. Section 14 went over some of the extra features that alter the appearance of the scorecard or add functionality. And finally, the last section took all the concepts we discussed in this video and applied them to real-world scorecard designs. We hope you enjoyed this video. If you need ideas, check out our portfolio at golfscorecards.com. We have over 200 samples on the website, and you can search for specific things like combo tees or maps. If you'd like more information or have questions about something we've discussed in this video, feel free to give us a call at 1-800-238-7267 or email us at info at golfscorecards.com. Thanks for watching.